Italian speaking and ready to pay too much attention to my terrible English accent and tell yourself that it could have been worse, it could have been a singing presentation. So, uh, <laughs> and I sing off key. Okay. And I hope a little more of uh, translation history is not too much for you because uh, I don't talk much. Uh, history, but don't worry, I'm not as erudite as Mr. Venuti is, so uh, I will keep it simple. So, uh, it may seem purposely backward looking to review the origins of revision, but I see it almost a duty to do so. The history a little known amongst the leaders and advisors who didn't have the good fortune to study under Odoff Gedek or Brenda Hosing. <coughs> Most importantly, I think that a look at the practices of the past help us understand where we came from and possibly where we should be going. But what do we know about the history of revision? Are there people who know a lot about the uh, history of revision here? No? no. O'Brien oh, must have done, but that Brian is revision, so that <laughs> when he's there, you get impressed. Nobody. So, I'll think about the forerunners. If we can take at face value the letter of Aristias to his brother, I think that the name of the brother was something like Philocrates, but I didn't check. History's first translation reviser was none other than the Holy Spirit himself. According to the, apo the apocryphal missive, the letter of Aristias, from the first half of the second century BC, Pharaoh told him to, uh, to 183 to 146 BCE, summoned 72 Israelites to the island of Pharos. For 72 days, <coughs> they worked independently in 72 different cells and produced 72 identical translations of the Old Testament. That the texts that were perfectly identical forces us to conclude that the same spirit in that all the, the violations power of 72 translators. And their, their, um, what to say? Okay, and <coughs> these translators are kind of coming more irritated in the name given to the version of the, the version of the Old Testament. What's the name? Septuagint. Okay. Without questioning the Holy Spirit's abilities as a project manager, it seems reasonable to suspect the involvement of one project manager or of one or more coordinators in the operation. A few centuries later, in 383, the Pope, the Pope Damascus, gave his private secretary, Jerome, we know the guy, eh? Jerome, the task of revising the extant versions of the Bible. After laboring on a project of 15 years, Jerome emerged from his Bethlehem retreat with a new Latin translation of the Bible, which is known as the Vulgate. And it hurt, it, it hurt him scorn and uh, many criticism, especially from uh, his non friend, the uh, Pogatin. Nevertheless, the Catholic Church eventually recognized the Pogatin, the common translation, as authentic. Truth be told, there is no doubt that in, that in massively reviewing the, the old text, the original, Jerome deviated from good editorial practice, which holds that one should retain as much of the original text as possible. Is that necessary? Do I have to do that? <coughs> one reminds me of writing lots of Now is my favorite part of this trip. In the ninth century, an organized revision process emerged. The Caliphs of Baghdad set out to work to make the works of the Greek, the Greek scientific <coughs> philosophers, available to the, to the Arab world. Caliph al Mamuni <coughs> established what can truly be called a translation center in Baghdad, and which is known, known today as the, the <coughs> LSSP. 
where a translator reviser will let a group of specialized translators, experts in medicine, mathematics, philosophy, and astronomy, who translated some 200 works, revised existing translations, and trained their less experimental groups. In other words, they served as advisors. The leader of this fine team was Ibn Ishaq, my hero after Brian, a translator, linguist, and physician. Moreover, contemporary testimonies reveal that it was standard practice at the time to ask a league with expertise in the field or in the domain to check the, the translation for scientific accuracy. Translation deemed to be unsalvageable by revision were ordered retranslated. <coughs> to me, this sounds like a large translation firm of today. I think that this is the ancestor of the uh, practice, the real practice of revision. After Baghdad, Haiti, the capital of translation shifted west to Spain. In the 12th century, Archbishop Raymond of Toledo uh, formed a kind of college of translators, staffed with scholars from all, all over Europe. At first, the client, the Archbishop, the Archbishop, checked the translations for accuracy. Then, as in the dad, that role fell to the college most acclaimed translator, Gerard of Cremona. Then, in the next century, translators working for King Alfonso, Alfonso the Wise, excuse me, had some of the translation revised by the king himself or by his royal secretaries. And an adjunct Renaissance. Boosting the great movement that was the Reformation, the first Bible started to appear in the languages of the faith. A number of revision offices emerged in the process. In France, for example, Calvin revised the, great, the first great Protestant Bible. It was, however, in England that the era's most extensive revision effort took place. Names such as William Tyndale and his successor, Miles Cloverdale, was uh, who revived <coughs> the Old and New Testament come to mind. In 1603, King James asked the senior members of the clergy to produce a translation of the Bible for approval by both civil and religious authorities. 47 scholars formed the translation committee and set to work on the message of liberation, but guided by the rules imposed by King James. The resulting work the authorized version, published in 1611, was a remarkable achievement, particularly for its pluralistic excellence, and it remained untouched until the 19th century. This is where I will conclude my much abridged overview of the history of revision. Obviously, the practice of revision has evolved since the Reformation, and I'm skipping many, many important developments. Still, the goal of this overview was to highlight the ancient origins of the practice, which language service providers considered essential for centuries. Happy were the days when no client or no translator needed to be convinced of the need for revision, since the client insisted at the time on a comparative, critical reading of both translated texts and those to be translated a process that became part of both the implicit and explicit standards of everyone from the Abbasid revisors to King James. Moreover, I also want to well silence those mean, mean spirited observer who alleged that revision was invented as a way to stroke the overinflated egos of certain translators. And to the recent past, Oh, yeah, I already break my promise not to, uh, not to keep looking forward, but I want to explain where we have come from. As we have noted, the origins of revision have deep ties to scriptures, or so it seems from my point of view that is the Western vent from the vantage, uh, from the Western vantage point. I don't know what, what it is about in Asia. It would be very interesting to know, but uh, I'm just a Westerner, so. Sorry about that. Um, it was, okay. Moreover, in the French-speaking world, there is a substantial amount of activity in literary translation. Uh, that's it. 
but few professionals take in enters in, the, in this field. And I must say that personally, I know uh, I know next to nothing about the activity in the English world. So, uh, but Vino is not there, but maybe Brian, give me a hand. Okay. On the professional side, that was a literary, not the literary, but I would say the sacred text side. On the professional side, it was the founding of the League of Nations, which by the end of the World War II, had led to the emergence of the Great Translation Bureau, and as a result, of the rise of the profession of reviser. Other multilateral organizations, such as the European Commission and the government of multilingual countries like Belgium or Canada, follow the same path. Similar departments, including revisers, appeared in NGOs uh, like uh, just, just such as the Red Cross or the uh, Pan European Health Organization. Taking the lead from such organizations, large companies also formed internal translation departments led by revisers. But, a couple of years ago, under pressures of economy personalization, translation was eventually outsourced to independent contractors, and this led to the emergence of big company, but this led to, to translation not being devised. Between 1890 and 2008, in Canada at least, and I think that some people won't agree with me here, revision fell on hard times and came to be seen as a necessary evil, or worse, an entirely superfluous activity. This attitude has been enshrined in the Canadian standard, I was part of it, CGS on translation services, in which, it's too bad, the majority of writers refused to include, to include the requirement to have the translated text revised. It's too bad to me. So Canada showed great timidity compared to the, to the European. Since in 2006, their standard EN 1538 formalized the importance of the revision task by including it among the requirements for all professional translation processes in Europe. But we didn't follow them. And yet, since then, revision has become a hot buzzword. Why? Apparently because the fear of paying for an, an ostensibly unnecessary service provision gradually gave way to a drive to invest in exponential growth of translators' productivity, and today the discourse is almost entirely focused on technology, especially on machine translation. So moving into a new paradigm. Two weeks ago, at the Association for Machine Translation of the Americas, AMTA 2012 <coughs> conference, I, I attended many workshops and what they call commercial tracks, commercial track presentations. After all these, tra these uh, workshops and uh, talks, I was struck by how certain terms kept coming up becoming pers persistent teams, the most compelling productivity and post editing. Language service providers to most power powerful tools, we know that, hard translation memories and machine translation. And not only will both technologies have an impact on how the on the revisers work, <coughs> they have already started to have an effect. It is tempting to repeat the cliche that our professions as, as translators and revisers are being transformed. But I will refrain from that because it seems to me that since the first time I did a professional translation on a typewriter, I, never, I have never stopped adapting from my typewriter to an, elect to an electric typewriter 
uh, from, uh, and then from dedicated word processors to word processing software, to local and then online uh, data terminology databases, uh, to documentation on the web, to MT, to TM, and to cloud computing. Today, we are living in an era where productivity growth is the only, the, is the holy grail. In its most industrial form, the translation industry is engaged in an endless search for ways to pump out the highest possible volume of copy at the lowest possible price. High volume no longer means a few dozen pages a day. It means millions of words a day. And this is the direction being taken in the request of clients, dazzled by the power of mass market products like Google, Bing, or Reversal, or the real or imagined capabilities offered by empty vendors like Sistrano, SDF, Language River, or TM companies like Multitrans or WordFast. To meet the demand, it stands to reason that we should eliminate the revision of step when it's possible. We cannot revise millions of words. We cannot revise as the same things that the words are produced by machine translation. So, but this notion, this notion it fits to the help of, its, of quality translations. Because, we must admit, aside from empty output in very narrowly specialized domain like uh, avalanche warnings or uh, uh, weather reports, machine translations do not impress us with their quality. And yet, if clients are consistently demand demanding more for less, one would think that it would relax their quality standards. In many cases, this logic applies, and the client sells, sells for relatively mediocre quality. In such cases, however, we are no, we're no longer dealing with the logic of traditional revising or translating. The world has changed. Right? To take a cue from dictionary definitions, let us say that we are no longer in the era of globalization as the act of globalizing or being globalized, but that we are in the result of this act. If you will, the planet is globalized. For example, whether the transactions, the transactions are friendly or not, the Chinese are taking over Ontario companies in which that's a that's an hypothetical example, in which Indian interests are also trying to invest through a Pakistani company. All the players must be able to understand each other. Machine translation can meet their needs because it fulfills their most important requirements, rough meaning, and speed. Considering competing multinationals such as Samsung and Apple, the two companies are beating each other up in the courts and claiming title to certain iPhone 5 components to protect themselves. They must register their, their, their patents in every country where they are planning to make business. Without machine translation or some other brand characters, um, and accounting for time zones, time zones are very important nowadays, patent applications must be Submitted must be registered simultaneously in every target country in order to keep the information from the competitor before it's too late. <coughs> for example, in Canada, it would be sufficient for Samsung to translate before Apple do either in, into either official language a patent related to one of their Apple-like components in order to obtain Canadian rights to the use of that component before Apple can do anything. In this case, the law emphasizes language and, the term, and in terms of speed, we must admit, admit that machine translation achieves performance goals that no human translators can manage. That was just an example, but we know that the exponential growth of the web and of e-commerce in every language means a quality rapid expansion in the use of that tools up to and including machine translation. Is that the anniversary? Who has the question at all? 
is to ask if you are witnessing, witnessing the, the hand of the individual translators. <coughs> According to a paper by Donald Barabé, a paper that is to be published in 2013, of Donald is the former vice president of translation in Europe, I quote, today, some experts estimate that a, that a sum of human knowledge is doubling every seven years, and by 2030, will double every seven, 72 days. We have stories in 72 years. Some even believe that it is already doubling every 18 months, and that no matter how fast human knowledge grows, it will have to be translated if it is to achieve its maximum usefulness. Now, more than ever, translators have a central role in society and, and in its transformations." And of quote. In other words, for a long time to come, there will continue to be discoveries and innovations of all kinds that will not benefit from translation memories or machine translation. Homo traduciensis may become extinct in the long term. But for now, and for some, and for some time yet, it's not an endangered species, no more than its cousin, the Homo rubiciensis. But there's already been a mutation, <coughs> thanks to the emergence of computer-assisted translation. And I will use the remaining minutes to outline to the intellectual morphology of this mutant, the post-editor. To be safe, I'll start by quoting Jeffrey Allen's 2003, uh, Jeffrey Allen's definition of what is post-edition. Quote, very simple. In basic terms, the task of a post-editor is to edit, modify, and or correct a pre-translated text that has been processed by an empty system from a source language into a target language. And of quote. At first glance, there's no distinction, distinction between post-editing and traditional revisions. But on closer examination, some fundamental differences emerge, particularly in cognitive and ergonomic terms. There is no need to underscore the similarities. Here, I want to zero in on three characteristic features of post-editing in contrast to revision. The setting, the relative quality, and the types of error. First, the environment in which post-editing is done is essentially computerized. Just an example, because of the volume of text produced by the machine, it would be unthinkable to commit all the translations to paper, correct them by hand, and then enter the correction into the system. Not to mention that every empty, all and related systems have a post-editing interface that displays, displays matches sentence or segments. And even if it's not always visible, just like in Google, we don't see that. In Google Translate, it's yes, but in Google Translate, no. It's not, the segments are not visible. All texts are technically segmented. No machine translation without segmentation. Reminds me something. In addition, the attitudes of clients and even the attitudes of some LSPs toward quality depending, uh, differ depending if it is a, a revising job or a post-editing job that has to be done. Traditionally, the revision client has expected publishable copy. That is, his goal was excellence. But today, with post-editing, this is not the case. Where, because quality is graded, I would say kind of officially graded, in terms of publication, distribution, and information. And what about errors? That's, a, that's very short. Man. What about errors? In a study by DCA, DCA is from the National Research Council, so that's yours. Um, by DCA, but no than myself, it was found that post editors claim not to be quote vigilant when working as revisers and as post editors. Post editors are guided mostly by the client expected quality level. 
that reminds me the thing about ethics. What do you do when the client doesn't want quality? But just as, as revisors, post editors will never ignore errors in meaning all language. <coughs> we are very reluctant to renounce to that. Okay? And revision, no effort is spared. I hope so. On relatively subjective matters like flow or cohesiveness of a text, whereas <coughs> in post editing, it may be that style is of no concern to the client who sees this facet of the text as nothing more than a waste of money. For a post editor, paying no attention to the style is quite a challenge. When working on output from statistical machine translation systems, because there are two kinds of translation systems and I'm confusing on the statistical, the statistical ones, it is not uncommon for post editors to find serious grammatical errors requiring them to strengthen out a garble, a garble mess that twists original meaning. <laughs> Such errors are much less common in human translation and if they are more common, that, but they are more common than you would like among non translators. I must admit, I'm a teacher, and I noticed that that they are, they are making mistakes that are just like a machine. Um, okay. Lastly, the post editor has to hope that once an error has been corrected, <coughs> the machine, that the correct form will be used in the future. We don't have the same hope with the students, unfortunately. <laughs> 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 we'll post it in transform the revisor. There is no scientific basis for a categorical answer to this question. Given that we currently have no idea who the post editors will be, but there is hope to there because the answer will be given by a, by a young woman, Gisele Almeida. It's the subject of her doctoral dissertation to be defended, to be defended uh, I think next month in Dublin. Some calls it that paralinguist, just like paramedics, will take up the task. Others says translator will do it. Still others expect established revisers to fill the room. In my opinion, an opinion grounded in my research, only professional translators with revising skills should take on this difficult, very difficult task. I know I tried. But not all of them are suited for post editing. It requires skills found in the beginners as well as, as in traditional translators or revisors, but in a more or less advanced form depending on the experience. What are these uh, abilities? and skills. First, the creativity. Creativity and intellectual agility to find fast, time-saving solutions. Flexibility in order to adapt to clients' various needs and demands. And appreciation for technology to make it possible for them to work with a fully computerized, in a fully computerized environment. Machine translation, translation memories, terminology database, internet, including social media and readers. And to be able to communicate and to work with the, I, with the IT team and other techies. And finally, the ability to manage, to manage projects as a team worker. Where are they? What will happen to those who have these qualities and competencies? For the coming years, and based, in, and based on data on the growth of knowledge and consequent translation needs, traditional translators equipped with new technology still have some good years ahead of them, but some will turn to post editing. And the role of post editing is not that rare. Post editing diversifies our work. It is another weapon to our arsenal. I don't like this metaphor. It even has a positive side. It has been shown that it improves our productivity by 20% at least. 
In other words, given the same quality of text it takes us, when a person says time to produce a final document compared to conventional translation. What's more, in every case, in every case where quality is of very great importance, the post-edit text is revised. So the process has therefore not put revisers out of work. Study of large, study of large companies and of language services firms have put me in contact with, believe it or not, very happy post editors who will not go back to their eight-hour eight days of translation and revising and revising for anything in the world. They now require the evaluation of post editing. And that would make an interesting topic for another talk. Is post editing? Addictive. <laughs>